Hello brothers and sisters of Christ. Right, this will be my final study. I've got all that I need, but I just wanted to do one more study. Um, Lord put it on my heart. One of the attacks that we're going to get, brothers and sisters of Christ, when we stand for the Word of God over, uh, I'll get into this, but culture and traditions of men. Okay? When we stand for the Word of God, one of the attacks that you're going to get, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that you evidently don't love the birth of Jesus Christ. When we say, hey, that, that Christmas, and that's what we're going to show in this study, that Christmas, it really has nothing to do with the Scriptures. The pagan practices, what you guys are actually doing, the physical acts of Christmas, have no basis in Scripture whatsoever. Right? And then one of the attacks you're going to get yelled at is you're going to get told, what, you have a problem with the birth of Jesus Christ? You must really hate the birth of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters of Christ, when we get done with the study, we're going to show that those who vehemently defend for Christmas, the stuff we're going to be putting over here, uh, they're the ones that really don't to have a problem with the birth of Jesus Christ. Don't let them bully you, brothers and sisters of Christ, that have given up things for the Lord because you're like, okay, it's not in the Scriptures. I was told I had to do this unto the Lord. One day above another, it's unto the Lord. It's not culture. It's not traditions of men. That's a lie. It's unto the Lord. I was told I had to do this unto the Lord. And then you start looking in the Scriptures after you truly get saved and born again. I used to be a false convert, brothers and sisters in Christ. I was part of the Babel building system. There was a lot of things that they said that we were supposed to do unto the Lord that when you looked in the Scriptures, they weren't there. And when you realize, hey, this has nothing to do with the Scriptures, I'm getting rid of it. You're going to have brethren out there, some are false brethren, because you have false brethren that will come in and mess up truly saved brethren. And so you've got false brethren and you've got truly saved brethren trying to bully you now. And one of the what tactics they're going to use to try to bully you into to being okay with Christmas, or even in to getting you to get back into Christmas. I've talked to some brethren, I've read comments under Brothers in Christ uh, studies on Christmas. And I seen, oh, I gave it up, but now I'm going to do it again. They've talked you back into doing something that has no basis in Scripture, as we're going to see in this study, and something that you gave up for the Lord. So it's not just a, be, you can do what you want, and I can do what I want. The whole point of all of this is to push brethren back into celebrating Christmas when they shouldn't be doing it. There is no, if you don't want Christmas, that's fine. I want Christmas, that's fine. And we can agree to this. That's not the whole point that Satan's using this for. He's using this to talk brethren back into doing something they know they're not supposed to do. Be very careful. Right? So this attack that we get, brothers and sisters Christ, when we say we want nothing to do with Christmas, Christmas is evil, Christmas is wrong, it's satanic, it's Catholic in origin, we want nothing to do with it, one of the attacks that you're going to get is, you must hate the birth of Jesus Christ. So in this study, brothers and sisters of Christ, and I'm talking to everybody, the ones who vehemently defend, to the ones who say I want nothing to do with it, we're going to go through this study and we're going to decide, and we're going to show, I'm going to show you who truly loves the birth of Jesus Christ, and who doesn't love the birth of Jesus Christ? All right. So we're going to start with the Scripture alone. Well, I'll explain this. I put Scripture alone, and I was tempted to put <laughs> uh, papal traditions. But there's this new word that people are, the brethren are starting to use now. It's culture. It's culture. It's culture. Culture is just the lost world's way of saying customs and traditions of men. So I put Tom over here. T-O-M. <laughs> Traditions of men. Okay. And we're going to separate the two, and we're going to go through the scriptures, and we're going to find out what actually has to do with the birth of Jesus Christ, and what has to do with this garbage over here. And it is garbage. Okay. Cultures and traditions of men. So, first thing that we're going to talk about is turn to Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to talk about the actual day of Jesus' birth. Now, brothers and sisters of Christ, this is not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to do, I'm going to do another study talking about the events prior to his birth, the day of his birth, and events after his birth, and what it led to. That's what we're supposed to do as Christians, Bible studies. But the world as a whole that loves Christmas, it's just about the day that Jesus is born. So we're going to just go over the day that Jesus was born. Okay, on the day Jesus was born, Matthew 2, chapter 2, verse 1. 
Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, okay, we get two things here when we get through this. We get where he was born, and that there was a star appeared on the day that he was born. Beheld there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, past tense, king of the Jews? Not present tense, past tense, king of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. His star in the east. Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, you jump down to verse 9, it says, When they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Not a baby in a manger, but a young child. So what's the point here? Scripture, we learn from this verse right here that, he is, that a star appeared on his birth. And that he was born in Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. Let's see if I can get this where it's legible. My handwriting is not the best, brethren. Please forgive me. So we get that he was born in Bethlehem and then there's a star. Now before we go any further, something i got to write on this side. Because as we go through the actual story of Jesus' birth, <laughs> one thing over here that goes over here in culture is the nativity scene. Okay. Why is this over here? Because we're going to find out that there's a lot of lies and deception in the nativity scene. Not just a couple. I used to think there was just a couple, but the God showed me through this study, there's a lot of lies in the nativity scene. It's Catholic in origin. It's fake. You should have nothing to do with the nativity scene. Okay? It's not according to the scriptures. And one of the things that, that we can talk, talk about right here is, is in the nativity scene, they usually show a star above where Jesus lay, was in the manger. Okay? That's not where the star was. Okay, we just read there. It went before them. They're, these wise men are in a far, far country. And, they're, and they see a star before them. Leading them, like I'm walking towards the camera. It's leading them over to where Jesus is. The star did not appear above Jesus in the manger. Okay, that's a lie. And oftentimes in the nativity scene, the star is usually a five-pointed star. Sometimes they'll do the star that looks like a cross almost. Like it's a straight line with a little small X at the top where it's like almost like a cross. And they try to show a star like that. But a lot of times in the nativity scenes that I've seen, the star, is a, it's a five-pointed star. Okay? But once again, this is just, you say, well, that's just minor. It would be if it was just like one thing. But as we get through this study, we're going to find so many things wrong with the nativity scene. Secondly, um, what we read here. This is after his birth. That's why I'm not putting down the wise men, because the wise men were not there on the day of Jesus' birth. Jesus did not get any gifts for his birthday. And I've talked about this in my Christmas studies, proving it through Scripture. He didn't get any births. But what did appear on the day he was born? A star appeared, and that's when the wise men started traveling. By the time you're reading this, Jesus is already born. He's like two to four years old. He's a child. He's not a baby in a manger. So there's the second thing that's wrong with the nativity scene. They throw the, they show, they throw the wise men in there to try to justify gift giving on Christmas. The wise men are there at the nativity scene where Jesus is in the manger. And they're giving him gifts for his birth. His birth. It's his birthday. We give gifts and we just give everybody gifts. That's nowhere in scripture as we're going to see. That didn't happen. Well, the wise men were not there. So that's why I'm going to put the nativity scene over there, because as we're going through this study, we're going to find a lot of things wrong with the nativity scene. Right? So we find out where he's born, and then a star appeared on the actual day of his birth. Okay? You go to Mark. Go to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. That's all the mentioning of... 
just real quick, in Matthew, it doesn't mention the day of Jesus' actual birth. When you actually start reading Matthew, it just talks about how the wise men show up, Jesus has already been born, past tense, and it starts getting from that point of the story on. It doesn't actually tell us about the actual day of Jesus' birth. We only learn from the wise men that a star appeared on the day of his birth. Okay. But let's get to Mark. What does Mark have to say about the birth of Jesus Christ? The day of his birth. Not referring to his virgin birth, but I'm talking about the day of his birth. It says here in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then it starts talking about John the Baptist. So we see in Mark, it doesn't talk about the day of Jesus' birth. So there's two Gospels that don't talk about the day of Jesus' birth. You say, what's your point? When we get through this, you're going to realize only one Gospel actually talks about the actual day of Jesus' birth. And it's still important, don't get me wrong, but remember how we used to preach and teach, some of the brethren out there preach and teach, that when God says something over and over and over and over, it's important. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And I mean very important. All of God's words are important, but there's some that are very important that we really need to heed. And they're taking a story that's in one gospel, and they're trying to turn it into a holy day and get people to worship. On, and we're going to get into all that stuff. Just all this nonsense over here, based off of one telling in the gospel. And nowhere are we supposed to turn it into a holy day, brother says Christ. We're not. Mm -hmm. So Mark, we don't have anything in Mark on the actual day that Jesus was born. Mm -hmm. Now if I'm wrong and I missed something, they went, I'm not talking about them talking back saying, hey, this, he, he was born of a Virgin Mary and he was born in Bethlehem because of the, the scriptures for, foretold and everything. I'm talking about an actual written detail of what happened that day. It's not in, and in Mark. Mark doesn't start with the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay. Turn to Luke, chapter 2, verse 1. Now we get to Luke. This is where the story is, okay? We're going to do another thing about another reading that proves that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, also known as the city of David, okay? And it was uh, foretold, okay? Uh, it is written, it is written, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that he would be born there. Luke, chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made in Serenius, when Serenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, where he was, out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife. You think it was just coincidence that the whole world had to be taxed and uh, Joseph had to come out of Galilee to go into Bethlehem so the prophecies, the scriptures could be fulfilled? The child was born in Bethlehem? No. God's got everything under control. He's, he's, he's guiding everything and he knows what's going on. Trust the Lord. Verse 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So we read from this passage that, once again, he's born in Bethlehem. These are the facts. We're going through the facts, brothers and sisters of Christ. Star appeared on the day he was born. He was born in Bethlehem. And you have Joseph and Mary. Okay, Mary's his mother, but we're talking about the day he was born. What happened on the day he was born? Okay. They laid him in a manger. You get this in the manger scene. You say, well, this is right in the manger scene. We'll get to that in just a second, but... Let's see if I can uh, write this. That's supposed to be manger. <laughs> but, like I said, my...
Manger, Manger, <laughs> please forgive me. Forgive my writing, and forgive my writing, brothers and sisters, Christ. Uh, manger, they laid him in a manger. Let's keep reading uh, verse 7 of Luke chapter 2. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And you say, well, why don't you go into that much detail? We're going to go into a lot of detail when we actually do the study the way Bible-believing Christians do. Where we read the Bible and we do a Bible study. We don't turn it into a flesh fest holiday. Okay? We stick with the Word of God. But for this study, we're just going over what actually happened that day. So what happened? When he was born, they were in the manger, which also, you can say the manger, they're in a barn. Okay? This is truth. You say, well, it's in the nativity scene. Well, yeah, it is. But what does the Bible say? We're not supposed to have any images of the Godhead. Who is the image of the Godhead? This was a whole other study we did together, brothers and Christ, going through the scriptures. Okay? Who's the image of the Godhead? Jesus Christ. He's the body of the Godhead. That's what you can see. You can see the image of God. What's, who's the image of God? Jesus Christ. And we're commanded not to make any images of Jesus Christ. That would include when he's a little baby. Okay? So once again, it's satanic because they draw pictures of, of some, some kid that isn't even Jesus Christ. And you're supposed to just take it. This is the baby Jesus Christ. This is the baby Jesus Christ. Once again, we're told not to. And what happens? They're turning the lost world. I'm not saying you, brothers and sisters of Christ, are doing this. But the lost world turns a baby Jesus into something to worship, an idol. Something to worship. Okay? That's why it's so dangerous. We're not supposed to have that. The, 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 the lost, professing Christian world worships a baby Jesus on Christmas. Now, you might not, oh, I don't worship and worship, but you're promoting that. Because that's what's going on out there. I see it every day. Well, I mean every day. Every year when it comes to Christmas, I see it out there. They're worshiping a baby Jesus. They have no clue who Jesus is. They're lost. But, oh, I'm worshiping Christmas, the birth of, of Jesus. A baby Jesus. Okay? So, yes, the manger's there. Yes, Jesus is placed in a manger, in a barn. Yes, it's in the nativity scene, but we're not supposed to have images of Jesus Christ. Okay? Because you're going to be deceived. Most of the world's deceived by this blonde hair, blue-eyed, Gentile Jesus that's not even Jew. And all these certain images of Jesus. And this is what Jesus looks like. This is what Jesus looks like. And... It's not what Jesus looks like. It's not what Jesus looks like at all. Okay? But I'm getting into a whole other study, brothers and sisters. When we talk about the Old Testament, where it talks about how he's not, he's not a movie star. Okay? He's not a, a fashion model. Okay? They, they're, it's just something about him that he just looks like a regular guy. Doesn't stick out. There's, that they should desire him. I'm trying to remember the verse off the top of my head. But there's nothing in him that they should desire him. In other words, just he doesn't stick out. He's not this very beautiful, mash, like super strong, muscular man. And he, he's, you know, he just looks like a regular guy. Somebody that you wouldn't even look at twice on the street as you walk by. But that's not how they portray Jesus in all these pictures and everything. He's just this model, this fashion model. Like an actor and, and everything. Yeah. You're not supposed to have images of Jesus Christ, period. Whether it's as a baby, as a child, or as a grown man. You're not supposed to have images of Jesus Christ. But we see there that there's the manger. That is in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now, multitude of heavenly hosts. You have angels and the multitude of heavenly hosts. We're going to get into that. So you have angels, an angel, singular, and multitude of the heavenly host. Uh, heavenly. I'm trying to write big enough so it can be read, but not too big to take up too much space. I'm not used to using a marker board. <laughs> so please forgive me. Angels and heavenly hosts. Okay. Let's keep reading verse 13. Uh, Luke 2.13. And 
And suddenly there was with the, the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, this is important. People say, well, they're singing, to, they're singing, they're, see, there's music and they're singing and everything on Jesus' birth. No, there isn't. Who brought that in? Who told you that? The scriptures didn't say it. What does the scripture say? And suddenly there was an angel in the multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, so they're praising God at the same time as they stop for a second to probably say this. Verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. You know what that reminds me of when they say that they're praising God? Heavenly host praising God? If we get to see a little bit about what's going on in heaven. Remember there's stuff in heaven where Paul has his, where he says that he knew a man once, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. He talks about how he went up there and heard things that shouldn't be uttered and everything. Okay. But what's the one thing God does let us know that's, being, that's going on up there? Do you guys remember the passage in Revelation where the creatures that are created, they're saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they stop for a second to go, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Okay? But the point is, is they're saying it. They're not singing it. Okay. Now, that's where we get angel. There's an angel singular. Once again, with the nativity scene, what's an angel? That's a whole other study, and there's Bible studies. Of Brother Brian at King J's Video Ministries has an amazing study on angels. It's an old audio study on angels. What are they? And we've talked about angels in the Bible. Angels are men. I'm not an angel, but looking at me, if I was you know, more fit and there was just something about me, you'd look at them and say, hey, the three men that walked up to um, Abraham, he looked at them and there was just something different about them. They, they're men. They're, they're told that they're men. But you come to find out that one is Jesus and the other two are angels. But they look like men. So what happens at the nativity scene? Almost every nativity scene shows angels with wings. And they're flying over baby Jesus in the manger. He, the Jesus is in the manger. I think. There's no angels actually there at the barn where Jesus is. Okay. I'm, I want to make sure I'm saying this right. Because I'm getting ahead of myself. And suddenly there was an angel, a, there, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. We're going to find out where this is happening at. Okay? So once again, you've got the nativity scene trying to cram all this stuff together, but it doesn't tell you the true story. First of all, those are angels. Angels don't have wings. Okay? Keep reading verse 15. This is where we learn about the shepherds. They're seeing this and saying this. Oops. They're saying this where the shepherds are in the field. So you have the shepherds. Read uh, Luke 2.15. And it came to pass that the angels had gone away from them into heaven... The shepherds said one to another. That's where it's happening. In the field where the shepherds are. Said one to another, Let us now go in to, even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. So they found... Uh, they found uh, Joseph and Mary and a baby lying in a manger in a barn. But one thing that uh, the Lord showed me in this, and I might be getting ahead of myself a little bit, where are other animals mentioned? If there were animals in the barn, wouldn't the shepherds have been in the barn taking care of the animals? Where were the shepherds? They're in the field. Where are the animals? They're in the field. So once again, the nativity scene is lying. Again. 
But we'll talk about why the nativity scene, because it's Catholic, why the nativity scene tries to put animals in the barn at the same time as Mary, Joseph, and, and Jesus in a, in a manger. Okay? But I wanted to point that out as we're reading actual scriptures. They didn't come and find animals. We came to find all these animals, Mary and Joseph and Jesus in a manger. No. It was just Mary, Joseph, and Jesus in a manger as a baby. That's all they found. Verse 17, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. So down in the future, after Jesus' birth, they make known everything that happened. That's how we get the story. Verse 18, And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. 19, But Mary kept all these sayings and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have heard and seen as it was told unto them. So, please understand, I'm not trying to upset brethren, but I'm trying to preach the truth of what the Bible says. The, the shepherds went to the manger. Praise the Lord. This is true. Look, it's here, just as they said he was. It's true. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, we got to go get back to work. And they went and got back to work, praising God the whole time, but they went and got back to work. Now, when we get over here and start looking at all the junk over here, you know, where's the feasting? Where's the huge celebration that people keep saying, oh, they had to have had a big celebration? No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Okay, there was no feasting. It's not there. Christmas dinners, Christmas gifts, you know, Christmas lights, all it, it's not there. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. And the reason I'm reading this, Luke chapter 2, verse 21, because we know the day is done. This is how we know this is all the information was given to us in the day that Jesus was born. Luke 2, 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of, an, of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And then you go into the story, which I want to go into when we do the full-on study, where you have the, the priest there that they're taking their turtle doves like they're supposed to, and he was told that he wouldn't die until he saw the Christ. So it's an amazing story. But Chris, they don't go, they, I've never been taught that story on the day, uh, as a lost man, I was never taught that. What do you, what, we've taught a little bit about what happened to Jesus before he got born, but his childhood and the things he went through, we weren't taught that. It was just this right here. And then they added a lot of junk, traditions of men, that have no basis in scripture. But we won't get into it. But the reason I kept reading is to let you know that I'm not just making this up. If I left something out on the actual day that Jesus was born, by all means, let me know, brothers and sisters of Christ. I could, make, could have made a mistake. But the point of this is we're going to show that this is Jesus' birth, day of birth, birth day. This is all garbage. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was younger and we did birthdays, the whole point of birthday is to show that, A, you were born at one time, and it shows you getting a day older. So you're getting a day older, but you're also getting a day closer to your death. Someday we're going to die. There's going to come a point that when you're dead, you don't do birthdays. I mean, some people can't let go of the dead, and some people try to still do birthdays for the dead, but that's it's, um, because they can't let go. But as a whole, when someone dies, you don't celebrate their birthday anymore. And like I said, birthdays are about, okay, this is another year, you're a year older, what have you accomplished in this year, and so on and so forth. How's this year been for you? And then sometimes you talk about when they were a kid, or they still talk about the same stories every Christmas, or every day that's your birthday, they talk about stories about mistakes you made in the past that were funny and everybody gets to laugh and everything. It's like, but it's all about you growing a day older. Yeah. So, Jesus' birthday, why are we celebrating Jesus' birthday? He's not growing a day older. Are you telling me Jesus is 2,054 years old, plus or minus a few years? And every year we've got to count another year. Now he's, he's 2,055, 2,056, 2,057. Right. 
That's how I was told. But when you actually look in the scriptures, which we have done, brothers and sisters in Christ, when it actually came to birthdays in the scriptures, only heathen nations did it. Wicked men who elevated themselves above the Lord. You had Pharaoh who was worshipped as a god, lowercase g god. You had uh, Herod who was worshipped as a god, a lowercase g god. They were celebrating their birthdays. Someone who was rich, very important, and the status of the people had elevated them to the point where they were being worshipped as gods. They're the ones that did their birthday. Okay? Just something to think about. I wanted to throw that in there. Uh, we'll go to John, because I said that it's only, Luke's the only one that gives us a good, good thing. We learn about the star after Jesus' birth in Matthew and where he was born. But the whole story of his birth, where he's born, what happens on that day, we find in Luke. But you turn to John 1.1, 1, 1. let's see what John thought was important. Was John saying, hey, the birth of Jesus Christ is just so, so important. I think God used John, through John, to explain that people are going to be taking this over here. And they're going to, the lost world, pagans, Satan worshippers, they're going to take this right here and pervert it. We're going to have it over here. They're going to show the perversion. And they're going to pervert it. And John comes, and here's John 1.1. 1, 1. What does John make out that's so important? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. Before this. Back to the very beginning. Don't get so caught up on this like some people do. Oh, Jesus was just a born, created being and everything and all that. Don't get caught up on this. In the beginning was the Word. Capital W. And the Word was with God. Body and soul. And the Word was God. They're connected. They are one. Jesus is God the Father. They are one because they're connected. The distinction is body and soul. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. You mean Jesus made the body of likeness, when he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, he created that body? Oh yeah. Verse 4, And him was life, and the life was the light of men, and, he, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness com comprehended it not. You see, John goes back to saying, hey, this is important. God told us about this. This is important. There's prophecies in the Old Testament that prophesied some of this stuff, if not all of it. It's important, but don't forget. Don't take this and turn it into a false god. Don't take this and be turning it into a holy day or holiday because Jesus was always there. He was always there from the beginning. He's not a created being. But we read, John doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, he doesn't talk about the birth of Jesus Christ. Is it important? Yes. But is it so important that we've got to turn it into an idol? Which we're going to talk about some of the things over here right now. Uh, that we turn it into an idol? I'm going to put down this pen. That we turn it into an idol? That we turn it into a holy day that's not in Scripture? No. We need to be focusing on Jesus Christ who is God fully and completely. The Jesus Christ who is risen. The Jesus Christ that is raised up into glory. Like I said, he died. His birth, there's no celebrating his birthday anymore. He's raised from the dead, incorruptible. He glorified. He's in his glorified body, back to his corruptible body that he had in the Old Testament. In the beginning was the Word. He's received up into glory, and he's in heaven preparing a place for you and me, brothers and sisters of Christ. That's the Jesus we're supposed to be worshiping. Not this. And some of you go, well, I don't worship that. Yes, you do. Don't lie. Yes, you do. Right. Some of you, like I said, I have no problem with this, brothers of Christ. It seems like the brethren that, that vehemently defend Christmas and the pagan practices that go with Christmas, they're the ones that have a problem with this. And I'm trying to help you, brothers of Christ. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to help you to see. That's why we're going to do the distinction. Okay, the nativity scene. Okay. We're going to get into it in just a second, but... First, the term Christmas. I 
had to put it in brackets because I'm trying to use it as a title, because it is a title. The title, Christmas. Okay. Where did we see that in the scriptures that we read about the day of Jesus' birth? It's supposed to be about Jesus' birthday. Where did we read about that over here, brothers and sisters in Christ? Where did we read it? It's nowhere to be found over here. It's traditions of men. Culture. Okay. It's traditions of men. Now, I want to ask at the end, when we go through all this, I'm going to ask why brethren out there who vehemently defend this garbage over here, why haven't they actually done a study on Christmas? The term Christmas, where does it come from? I did. When I found out where it comes from, I was shocked. I was told my whole life, it's Christian, it's Christian, it's Christian. But the term Christmas isn't in Scripture, so then you have to go, well, where does it, do where does it come from? And I've done the study on it. The Catholic Church came up with the term Christmas. What I have is I have a faulty switch, and it's probably one of the breakers are going bad. And since I have my pellet stove broke, and I started using this new heater that I bought, it takes a lot of power to run all these heaters, and sometimes it makes the switch flip off, and I have to go reset it. So it happens. But back to what we're saying, Christmas. The term Christmas, we just read in the scriptures. Where is it at? It's nowhere to be found. The, the terms that go along with Christmas, you know, where does they come from? Well, I've done a study on the history. We couldn't do it from the Bible because the Bible has nothing to do with Christmas. So I had to go to the lost world and say, okay, law of first mention. Who came up with the term Christmas? And you'll be shocked. There's the Catholic Church. You say, but I have brethren who do studies that mock that and say, people say that, but that's not true. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be mean, but they're lying. You do the historical study on the term Christmas and where it comes from. It comes from the Catholic Church. How about December 25th? December 25th. Do a TH there if you want to. What about December 25th? Okay. Where did that come from? We just read the scriptures. It didn't tell us the exact day that Jesus was born. It gave us the season. And this is where we get, we're going to get back to the nativity scene, why it's so wicked and it's Catholic. Okay. It gave us the season. It was a warm enough season that the that the uh, shepherds were in the field with the animals. The animals were out and about at night. They sleep outside at night. It's warm. But the nativity scene, do you ever wonder why they show all the animals at the nativity scene? Because they're trying to justify December 25th. Oh, Jesus was born December 25th. That's why all the animals are in the barn, because it's a cold part, because it is the cold part of the year. It's cold. Okay. I just looked over at the... <laughs> I had a video that I like to watch. Uh, there's a guy, he's not saved, but he does videos where he walks through Jerusalem and it's just a walk. There's no talking. There's no trying to push anything. He's just showing you the back the roads, the, the different main parts of Jerusalem and all the cities around Israel and everything. And I love watching that. But I just watched his recent video and everybody's all coated up. It's like, it's cold. Or he's like, Christmas is here. Or not Christmas. He says, winter is here. Winter is here. You know, they're all like, it's cold. The animals would be inside. That's why they show the animals in the nativity scene. Trying to justify this date right here, which we all, brothers and sisters Christ, which we all know to be false. Jesus wasn't born in December. We don't know the exact day, but we know the season. It kind of reminds me of the castaway of the body of Christ. Brother of Christ, Brother Brian, who I disagree with with Christmas. As you guys can tell, we disagree. And it's not something we can agree to disagree, as you can tell. Some of the brethren who have been following the studies that God has shown me through all this. But he does a great study. Okay, on uh, We don't know the exact day the casting away of the body of Christ is going to happen. But he has. I think the title is like, No Man Knoweth the Year? Question mark? Because it talks about the day, he talks about the Bible, gives us signs, lets us know the seasons... And when we're getting closer and closer to catching away the body of Christ, we're seeing signs. One of them is the falling away. And it really gets me depressed and gets me down. I was talking to a brother in Christ online last night for a couple hours because I was depressed. Looking around at what's going on in the world. Brethren falling away and 
going the way of the world and people, brethren aren't working that hard trying to fight for the Lord in ministry and putting out those Bible studies, fellowship and everything, people breaking fellowship over things that's not worth breaking fellowship over. And it's just the body of Christ is not in good, good condition right now. But if you read the scriptures, it said, but God said it's going to happen. I'm not saying we should just go with it. We should try to fight it and we should try to come together and strive together in unity being of one mind, one body, one mind. But God said that there's going to be a falling away before the catching away of the body of Christ. And he does a great study on it. And that's where it reminds me of it reminds me of the same thing. We don't know the day that Jesus is born, but we know the season. It was a warm season. Warm enough that the animals were sleeping outside and the shepherds had to be out there watching them at night. December 25th. No word in Scripture. We know Jesus wasn't born December 25th. So brothers and sisters of Christ, the question to ask is, why December 25th? Law of first mention. Who came up with December 25th? And it proves that the nativity scene is Catholic and it's very satanic. Very, very satanic. Stay away from the nativity scenes. Okay? Stay away from them. They're lies. They'll deceive you. Um, and I can keep writing, which we are, <laughs> okay, um, I could, all this, we're going to keep pointing back to there. If you can read it, please, I'm going to talk tree, Christmas tree, Christmas lights, Christmas uh, dinner, if I, can, if I can write that right. Where's the Christmas tree at in the birth of Jesus Christ? Brothers and sisters of Christ, where's the Christmas tree at in the birth of Jesus Christ? It's not there. You see, they act like we hate this over here. We love this over here, brothers and sisters of Christ. We love the Word of God. We hate when culture, traditions of men, come in and try to trump the Word of God. Oh, the Christmas tree has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ, but who cares? We're still going to do it anyway. He made the commandments of God. He said, add not to, nor subtract from his word. Numerous times. Once again, I'm admit, there was a brother in Christ that did a great study on that. Okay? You're not to add to God's word. You're not to add to God's word all throughout the Bible. It's not just in Revelation. It's throughout the Bible. You're not to add to. You're not to subtract from. Where's the Christmas tree at? You say you're doing it for the birth of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus' birthday. That's what Christmas is all about. Chapter and verse. See, we Bible believers that love the birth of Jesus Christ, we say chapter and verse. And brethren are getting upset. Brothers and Christ, this isn't me trying to upset you. This is me trying to point you back to absolute truth. Reminding you who your first love is. When I got saved, my first love was the Word of God. I couldn't get enough of it. I started studying the Word of God. I started learning that almost everything I knew about Christianity and these Babel buildings, they stole stuff from the Bible, the real Bible, the King James Bible, and they perverted it. Most of it was a lie. I didn't even know about all the major doctrines. I didn't know about, you know, a lot of things. Instruction and righteousness, the Bible version issue dispensational teaching. I was told, yeah, you're, you're once saved, always saved, once saved, always saved. But I never understood what eternal security really is. Because they were too distracted in these Babel buildings by this garbage over here. And as a brother in Christ who loves you, I'm trying to bring you back to this. Chapter and verse. Your first love. We're going to run a room over here, but because there's just so much that you can throw over here that they've added so much to the birth of God. Where's the Christmas gifts and the birth of Jesus Christ? Everybody taking gifts, wrapping them, putting them underneath the Christmas tree. It's not supposed to be an idol. It's not an idol, but we talked about this. I'll, I'll talk about it for a little bit more here, but we talked about high places and, and groves in the Old Testament. They had trees that they would adorn 
okay? Um, they would deck these trees, put false gods on top, and put gift offerings underneath. So where are they doing this in the birth of Jesus Christ? Jesus never got any gifts on his birthday. Mary never got any gifts on, her, on Jesus' birthday. Um, Joseph never got any gifts. The, the shepherds never got any gifts. The angel never got any gifts. And I can keep going. Where are the gifts? All right. Here's the tough one. Let's see if I can do it right. Ugh. My knees aren't doing so good. That's ah, not going to go out right. We're going to do social gatherings. Where's there a big social gathering at Jesus' birthday? Now, don't get me wrong, you can come together as a house church and study the Word of God, whether it's the birth of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the major doctrines, eternal security, you can talk about eternal security, pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, dispensational teaching, instruction in righteousness. You can come together as a group to study the Word of God and learn and apply it to today. And I'm getting ahead of myself because there's a verse that talks about that. Okay. Now we're in out of room, because I was also supposed to put on Christmas carols. Christmas carols, Christmas wreaths, Christmas stockings, Christmas this, Christmas that. And it just goes on forever. It just keeps going and going and going and going. You know what the nature of perversion is, brothers and sisters Christ? When you start perverting this with just the simplest thing, oh, I just do Christmas tree on December 25th with Christmas lights and some gifts. I just do a little bit of it. You know what the nature of perversion is? When you start perverting this, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And the list just keeps going down and down and down. Most of the lost world loves this over here. This is all about the flesh. It gets you enticed in the flesh. How do they get people to celebrate Jesus' birthday on December 25th? By making it all fleshly. And I'm getting ahead of myself again. How did the Old Testament... The king of the ten tribes. How did he get them to do animal sacrifices and not go to Jerusalem to do it? He gave them a false idol. And gifts, dinner, music, made it a festival, a party time, and got them to do it. How, how does the Catholic Church get people to celebrate, save people to do it? And how do they get lost people to do it? Well, they bring in Santa Claus to get the lost world to do it. Basically, a lot of this stuff has to do with Santa Claus, period. But they have a way to get the lost and the saved to celebrate something that has no basis in Scripture. And you have brethren that love you, brothers and sisters of Christ. You have brethren that love you, that are imploring you. They're like Paul, crying night and day with tears, warning you. You've got people coming in and destroying the birth of Jesus Christ. And he's crying with tears because he knows a lot of people are going to stick with this. They're not going to listen to him. I'm crying with night and day with tears, praying for the brethren, the body of Christ. Not just with Christmas, with a lot of things. Stay away from this garbage. Stay away from it. Proverbs 16.1 The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. There was a time where I didn't see anything wrong with any of this. In fact, I loved all this stuff over here. As a false Christian, raised in a so-called Christian home, we were doing every holiday. We did Easter, we did Halloween, we did a lot of the holidays. Yeah, it seemed right in our own eyes. But the Lord with the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. You take this over here and you commit it unto the Lord, His Word, for today. Commit thy works unto the Lord. You compare your works to the Word of God. Is this godly? Is this a Christian thing to do? Oh, but it's just culture. It's just culture. It's just traditions of men. It's not that big of a deal. Yes, it is. Why did Jesus attack the Pharisees? Because they brought in culture, traditions of men, and used this over here to trump the Word of God. 
the trumpet. But the Lord weigheth the spirits. Another thing that I wanted to point out with this verse that a brother in Christ showed me recently, no matter how many times that the Lord gives us free will, the Lord gives us free will. Yes, He does. You can choose to get saved or you can choose not to get saved. Romans 14, 5, the day there that's above another day is unto the Lord. It's the Lord commanded. And the part there that says, uh, let every man persuade his own mind. we got brethren that get stuck on just that one phrase, let every man persuade his own mind, let every man persuade his own mind. And the point I was trying to get across, which this kind of explains it, is that even when God gives you a choice, be very careful that you're still not taking the authority of God out of His hands and putting it in yours. That day that's, unto, that's above another in Romans 14.5, if you keep reading Romans 14.6, it's a day that's unto the Lord. Once again, the authority is in God's hands. It's never in yours and it's never in mine. Praise the Lord that it's never in mine. I would make a mess of everything. That's what man does. They make a mess of everything. All this garbage over here. Something wonderful, something beautiful, something amazing and great. Man's wisdom tends to pervert it. God is still the final authority. Yes, you can choose to keep a holy day. Or, I'm sorry, you can choose not to keep a holy day, Sabbath day, new moon, and now there's no consequences. Yes, you can choose that, but still, who's the final authority? God is. Not you. God is. Don't forget that. But we're supposed to be comparing our works, the things we do and claim we're doing it for the Lord, we're always supposed to be comparing it to the Word of God. And when you compare all this stuff to this over here, this stuff over here is garbage. It's nonsense. When you actually start doing the studies, I'm getting ahead of myself, turn to Mark chapter 8, verse 31. When you actually study, do the law of first mention on all this stuff over here, you'd be appalled on how much this stuff goes against the Word of God. Pagan worship, false god worship, Satanism. It's just evil and wicked. Mark 8, 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed. After three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly. And Peter took him and rebuked him. I feel like that's what brethren are doing to me. I'm saying this, brother and sister Christ, we love the birth of Jesus Christ. Those of us who are against Christmas, we love the birth of Jesus Christ. This stuff is garbage. And what are brethren doing? They're pulling me, they're not even pulling me to the side, they're doing it openly. They won't do it like, you know, Peter was trying to rebuke Jesus privately. You're supposed to go to your brother in Christ one-on-one. -on -one. Whole other story. But you're where I'm getting pulled to the side and getting rebuked for this stuff over here. Saying this stuff over here is satanic, wicked, and it's garbage. I'm being rebuked. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter openly saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. So you have brethren out there that are saying, We hate the birth of Jesus Christ. I'm trying not to raise my voice and get frustrated. I just do. I apologize, brother, says Christ. I just I love the word of God. Not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Why do you call Peter Satan? Because that's what Satan does. That's what his minions do in the world. It's all about getting you away from the Word of God and getting you to do things the world's way. Every time. Every time. That's Satan's way. He wasn't actually saying Peter is Satan. He was saying that Peter, are you working for Satan? Then why are you pulling this junk over here? Why are you savoring the things that must be of the world and not the things that be of God? Are you working for Satan? Is Satan sifting you like wheat? We learn that later on. Or Jesus sits there and talks to Peter and says, Satan has a th sought to sift you like wheat. The number one person that Satan wants to go after, he goes after the women first. It was a great study done by Brother Christ. But what I'm noticing in these last days, the number one thing that Satan's going after is, the, is people that, that have been called into preaching and teaching. Okay, He's trying to sift us like wheat. He's trying to destroy me. He's trying to destroy people like Brother Brian. He's trying to destroy people like Brad Affenshine, uh, Jacob Thomas. Okay, 
brethren that are getting into ministry to serve the Lord, they become a bigger target for Satan. I gotta get rid of them. I've gotta get them back into their flesh. I gotta try to get them back into some of their temptations and the sins that they, they love. I gotta get them back into the world. Let's distract them with the world and worldly things. They do it. He tries to sift you like wheat. Luke 22, 31 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not God's way. This is man's way. This is God's way. Saying, hey, I'm going to the scriptures, and this is my final authority in all matters of faith and practice. If I'm doing something in my life and I claim I'm doing it unto the Lord, it better be in Scripture. And if it's not in Scripture, you shouldn't be doing it. And you'll have people, I want to throw this out there, but you always have people that I believe are, they're false and they're, they're trying to infiltrate true Bible-believing God-fearing movements and they'll say something and that phrase will get passed on to people who are saved. And one of the things is, where's cars and trucks in the Bible? Where's this in the Bible? Uh, there was people tra who used transport, who were riding donkeys, horses in the Bible. There was people using modes of transportation in the Bible. Okay, but you see, they can't handle with what is there, so they got to say what isn't there. Bottom line: when you say you're doing something, I don't say every time I get into that truck, it's I'm I'm doing it to worship God. And it, no, I thank God for that truck that He's given me. It helps me get from point A to point B. I thank Him for it, but I'm not getting into that. Okay, that truck's now going to be a holy day and a holiday, and I'm going to start worshiping that truck as an idol. But you have brethren that will try to do that to you. Be careful. Be very careful. When someone comes to you and makes a statement like that, be very careful. You're either talking to someone who's false, or you're talking to someone who's been hanging out around someone who's false. That's not something a saved man says. They say, what is in the Scriptures? And what we're talking about here, this is in scriptures. The star that appeared, not over the manger, but the star appeared ahead of the, Jew, uh, the uh, wise men that were from a far, far country, and it took them two to four years to find Jesus as a child. They traveled from far, far away. And the star was always before them as they were traveling. He was born in Bethlehem. He was born in a manger, in a stable. Okay? There was no animals in the stable. It was just Joseph, Mary, and the baby. How do we know that? Because when the shepherds came, that's all they found. Okay? And there was angels in the host of heaven, the shepherds in the field, the animals were in the field. This is the Word of God. This is what we're supposed to be elevating, the Word of God. Not this junk over here. Romans 14 Oh, well, I already mentioned it, but let every man persuade in his own mind. People get so stuck on that. Let every man persuade in his own mind. Let every man see. I have free will. I have the authority. I get to choose. Let every man persuade in his own mind. Let every man... and they miss the whole context of Romans 14. Period. The whole chapter. Okay. There's a different spirit around this pagan stuff. You're indulging in this, and you're vehemently defending this. You're inviting fall. Uh, you're inviting different spirits, evil spirits, into your home. Because a man who loves the Word of God would have read, okay, that one day above another, let's compare Scripture with Scripture and get the context of what that one day is. Oh, it's unto the Lord. Okay, where else are people being told they have to keep this day in order to be saved? Oh, that's right, in Galatians, uh, Colossians 2. Okay, this is the Levitical laws. Okay? The holy days, the Sabbath days, the new moon. You compare Scripture with Scripture, but when you get stuck on let every man be persuading his own mind and justifying this stuff, it's a different spirit. Comparing, I know brethren that used to compare Scripture with Scripture with Scripture with Scripture and love the Word of God. They're slowly drifting away. And they're going for traditions of men. Culture. Yeah. Romans 8.13, For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, capital S Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live, brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul talks about in Romans 8, that when you were lost, you were carnally minded, walking after the flesh. This is all fleshly. 
the tree, the lights, the dinners, the gift, the music, the social gatherings, not fellowship, social gatherings, the party time, it's all flesh. The carnal mind says, I don't care, I love it. But when you get saved, you are now spiritually minded, capital S, Holy Spirit guided. You are spiritually minded, and you start walking after the Spirit. I also call him the Comforter. He's going to come in and he's going to open this book to you. Through, and that's what that verse says. But if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. The Spirit's going to show you the difference between what's godly and what isn't. And there's brethren fighting them on this. And you've got to let it go. My pleading for you is to let it go, brothers and sisters of Christ. It's not worth it. Now, I kind of mentioned this, but I want to make a strong mention of this again. The brethren that are in ministry that vehemently defend Christmas, God brought it to my attention. He says, you realize they really haven't done a study on any of this over here? <laughs> you might be able to hear my rooster. It was raining, so I, I couldn't let him out. They haven't really done a study on this. I, I know a brother in Christ that um, has multiple studies on Christmas, but he actually doesn't have any study on Christmas. He has zero studies on Christmas when you think about it. All his studies is justifying mixing this garbage with absolute truth and why it's okay. It's okay for us to do this. But he doesn't actually have any studies on the origins of Christmas. The term Christmas, where does it come from? I gave you a study on it. December 25th. Why December 25th? We know it's not his birthday. Why then December 25th? I was ignorant at one time. I didn't know. But because of love of the truth and the inconsistency between the two? Lord, I'm supposed to be a man about that's supposed to be after you. I want to be a man after your own heart. I want to be a man that's after absolute truth. And I had to do a study and found out where this is, why December 25th was chosen. The Catholic Church coined Christmas. The Catholic Church chose December 25th for Christmas. This is absolute truth. My question is, these brethren that are in ministry, they're vehemently defending that it's okay, it's okay, we have the right to choose. How come they've never actually done a study on the origins of Christmas? The term Christmas, December 25th. How come they haven't actually done a study on the origins of the Christmas tree? They're so quick to tell you that Jeremiah 10 is not the Christmas tree, it's not the Christmas tree. But then they won't turn around and tell you where the Christmas tree came from. What is the Christmas tree then? Where does it come from? It didn't come from over here, the Word of God, as far as the birth of Jesus Christ. Where did it come from then? Now, Jeremiah 10, we'll talk about that in a closing video, but Jeremiah 10, there's no difference between Jeremiah 10 and the Christmas tree, as far as idols go, idol worship. Bringing in culture, bringing in traditions of men. An idol is an idol. Whether it's a statue or whether it's a tree that you've cut down and, a, and, a, and decked, not gilded, decked, and put in your uh, living room and a prominent place for all to see. Yeah. Okay, there's no difference when idol worship is idol worship. Okay? But why do they refuse? They refuse. They've been asked, can you do a study? Well, if the Christmas tree, if, if Jeremiah 10 has nothing to do with the Christmas tree, then can you do a study on the origins of the Christmas trees and the practices and stuff that they would hang on the Christmas tree, what they would do with the Christmas tree? Can you do a study on it? No, I can't do a study on it. No, I won't do a study on it. Why not? Because when you actually do a study on this, brother and sister Christ, you can try to say, I want to be willfully ignorant. At this time, at this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth every man everywhere to repent. You were ignorant, and God forgave you. You're not ignorant anymore. I'm pointing you, saying this is wrong. Something's not right. You need to be doing more studies, and I have studies on this, some of this stuff. I didn't have to do studies on all of it. Just a few studies I did on the origins of this stuff was enough to say, I want nothing to do with it. I want nothing to do with it. Okay? And what I'm realizing, real quick, I watched, uh, I got caught up in a debate online, not me in the debate, but watching a video of a debate online on abortion. And the guy is lost as can be, but he's 100% against abortion, but he's lost as can be. 
the point he made is there was a woman, this, this girl is just ignorant, just the ways of the world, big time, and she stands up, and he's, she's trying to defend abortion, and she talks about rape case victims, okay, that, that that should be okay for abortion and everything, and he sits there and looks at her and goes, okay, do you realize that the rape case victims, or I think he said are less than 2% of all abortions out there? Less than 2%. And he told me, he said, if we can agree all the other 98% is evil, it's wrong, you're killing babies, then we can talk about the 2%. Can you agree to that? And she looked at him and wouldn't agree to that. He says, oh, so you're just using the 2% as justification for the 98%. It was a smart argument, but like I said, debating. But it's like, I'm like, Lord, that's what's going on here. You guys are using this. To justify this. You're hiding behind this to justify this. This is 100% wrong. This is 100% right. So you hide behind something that's 100% right to justify something that's 100% wrong. Brothers and sisters of Christ, isn't that not what's going on? We're being attacked, brothers and sisters. If I say... Anything bad about Christmas, I've got an attack told that I must hate the birth of Jesus Christ. Because the birth of Jesus Christ, this is 100% truth. This is 100% correct. And it is. But they're using it, they're hiding this, they're using this to justify that. That's evil. That's wicked. That's sinful. You need to stop, brothers and sisters of Christ. You need to stop. Using this to justify cultures, traditions of men, evil and wickedness in your life. And I've seen people do it, not just with Christmas. This just has to be the subject we're talking about right now, brothers and sisters of Christ. But I've seen people use it all the time. They try to take things from the Bible and pervert it to justify sin. To justify garbage and stuff like this. They do. All right. Matthew 15, 7. Matthew 15, 7. Ye hypocrites... Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth. It's about Jesus' birth. And honor me with their lips. Oh, I'm just, I'm just honoring the birth of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth. God manifests in the flesh. But their hearts are far from me. It's all about the flesh. It's all about the flesh. But in vain they do worship me. In vain they do worship me. Why? Teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. That's what's going on here. You can't get away from it. You can try to use good words and fair speeches. You can try to appeal to the flesh, which is what this all does. This all appeals to the flesh. You can try to be a people pleaser. I'm doing it for my wife. I'm doing it for my husband. I'm doing it for my son. I'm doing it for my daughter. You can be a people pleaser, or you can be a God pleaser. What's it going to be? You can't have both. And if you go back to verse 6, it says, Thus have you made the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. This stuff over here always, always, I don't care who you are, always overpowers this. How do we know? Because brethren are willing to fight and die for this right here. Give up fellowship with brethren. That's why I called it the, I have been saying lately, uh, putting brethren, sacrificing brethren on the altar of Christmas. They're willing to sacrifice a brother in Christ for this, and they're not willing to fight for this. They have made commands of God of none effect by your traditions. The Bible says we're to love one another, we're to correct one another. You see someone heading for destruction, you don't keep your mouth shut. So this might be tough for some of the brethren out there, and they might get frustrated when I say this, but those out there who said, I see all this, and I agree this is all, this is wrong, this is truth, I want nothing to do with this. But when you see a Christian, like a Christian brother, like Brother Brian, that's doing all this, and you're like, well, we can just agree to disagree. If you don't love your brother. I'm not going to say anything. You're headed for destruction. I'm not going to say anything. When brethren try to tell me, hey, Christmas is okay, it's not just brother Brian, any brother or sister in Christ. Oh, I love Christmas. I'll tell them the truth. 
And then they have to make the decision on their own. Am I going to follow God and His Word? Or am I going to go the way of the world? you got to make the decision. You want a free choice, there you are. That's the decision you have to make. And a lot of brethren have made this decision over here and turned their backs on this. And not just turned their backs on this, they turned their back on brethren. Over this. It's garbage. I don't need this. The Bible says, with food, with food and raiment, therewith be content. Food and raiment, therewith be content. I don't need all this. God gives me clothes. He's given me food. I'm not going to sacrifice a brother in Christ over all this garbage and junk. It's not worth it. But there's some brethren who do. There's some brethren who do. Ye hypocrites. And I've been called a hypocrite because I stand for the Word of God. You're a hypocrite. I stand for the Word of God. When I'm wrong, I repent. And I pray that, you know, that the times that I'm stubborn about it, that God will get that stubbornness out of my life and that pride out of my life so I can repent. I'm not wrong here. More importantly, the Word of God is not wrong here. Those who stand for this over here, they're 100% wrong. And they know it. You know it. Romans 15.4 Here's the thing to remind you of, brothers and sisters. This stuff here, the birth of Jesus Christ, the information He gives us, do you realize it's in the Old Testament? Oh yeah. The New Testament doesn't come in until Jesus' death on the cross. That's when the New Testament comes in. This is all Old Testament. Romans 15.4 for, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. Not to be turned into some hellish day, holy day, though it's written for our learning. The story of Jesus' birth is for our learning. Not to be turned into a flesh day. Why? Why is it written for our learning? That we through patience, and I'm working on that, brother and sisters Christ, please pray for me. Through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, not comfort of the cultures or the traditions of men, the comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And we're going to talk about this hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded one towards another. We're supposed to be like-minded. We're all supposed to be over here. Someone once said that this is just a minor thing and it's not worth making a big deal out of. No, standing for the Word of God is worth making a big deal over. We're all supposed to be of one mind. We're supposed to be here. Not over here. Okay? Time and time again. Like-minded one towards another according to Christ. The man who you claim you're celebrating his birthday. I'm messing up the, the writing, sorry. The man you're claiming to be celebrating his birth is supposed to be after him, according to him. Supposed to be according to his word, sanctified to thy truth, thy word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's according to God. Okay? Not according to culture, traditions of men. Let every man persuade his own mind. Let every man persuade this. If we have the authority, no, once again, this is showing according to Jesus Christ. God is always the final authority. And he always will be. Not me. Not Brother Brian. Not King James Video Ministries. Not any other brother out there. Not these hirelings in these Bible buildings. Not these lost people. Okay? God is the final authority. He always will be, and that's that. That ye may with one mind, when God is our final authority, His perfect written word is our final authority, we're going to be of one mind. The times that you see the body of Christ where they're splitting, there's division, there's division. It's because there's some people that are straying from this being the final authority. And they're going for junk like this over here. They're going the way of the world. That's what causes division every time. Every time. Right? You have lost people coming in, sowing seeds of division, and getting people back out into the world, and trying to entice your flesh. You want gifts, don't you? You want to have good food, don't you? Don't you miss all the social gathering and hanging out with people and partying and everything and all the lights and the tree? It's all appealing to the flesh, getting you back into the world. 
Right? Now, and, and I can't say this dogmatically, but what I can say is, is the early Christians, because when you look up the term Christmas and where it came from, it was created by the Catholic Church. The date, December 25th, why December 25th? The Catholic Church designed this, said December 25th. The early church wanted nothing to do with Catholicism, and they, didn't want, they had nothing to do with Christmas. So the question I ask again to try to just plead to my brothers and sisters in Christ, okay, now, sitting by the fire or wherever and reading the story of Jesus' birth and learning from it, it's before time written for our learning. It's not a holy day. It's not a holiday. It's written before time for our learning. Okay. How come that's not good enough anymore? And that's why I want to ask you, brother, sister of Christ, to vehemently attack me and vehemently defend this garbage over here. How come this isn't good enough anymore? How come the Word of God isn't good enough anymore? That you have to add all this to spice it up, to make it more fun. There's nothing, there's, what is it? I had a brother Christ who vehemently defends this garbage over here say, there's nothing wrong with him, with, with his wife, my, my wife, my son, and I having fun, and he's referring to Christmas. This isn't good enough anymore for you? Brother Christ, sister in Christ, we have to add this garbage over here to it to make it fun, to make it interesting. This isn't good enough. The Bible as it is is not good enough anymore. Some are saying no with their actions. You say, yes, I'm a Bible believer. Yes, it's God's perfect written word. Yes, it's my foundation in all matters of faith and practice. But your actions are saying otherwise. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.14 Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Man's words, no profit. God's words, 100% profit. 100% profit. No profit. How do we know this? Keep reading. Verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Talking about the word of God, whether it's the spoken word or the written word. But shame, profane, and vain babblings. This is going to get me in trouble, some of the brethren. The people that defend this and twist scripture to defend this over here, it's vain. Okay? It's, it's profane. They're profaning the Word of God, they're profaning the birth of Jesus Christ, and they're using vain babblings to try to defend it. Vain babblings. For they will increase unto, uh, they will increase unto more ungodliness. See how the list just, if I could, I could just keep writing all the way down, I could keep writing all over the wall, all these different traditions that people have interdoctrinated into Christmas, and it just keeps going and going and going. Why? Because it increases into more ungodliness. That's the nature of perversion. It gets worse and worse and worse. You can, they can't just handle this right here. They start perverting the Word of God, profaning the birth of Jesus Christ. And then it gets worse. Now you've got Santa Claus. Now you've got reindeers. And now you've got this. Now they fly. Now you've got magic. Sorcery. Yeah, and they just keep going and going and going. Where does it end? It ends when you say, you know what? I'm dropping all this garbage over here and I'm standing for absolute truth. And I'm sticking to the Bible as it is. That's when it ends. And that's the only time it'll end. It'll never end as long as you try to justify any of this stuff up. You might not be for Santa Claus, but Christmas tree is. Christmas lights are. Christmas gifts are. Christmas dinners are. Christmas social gatherings. It's all linked together, and it just keeps getting perverted more and more and more. A lot of brethren that I've talked to had a weight lifted from them when they, knew, when they came to the knowledge of the truth. Christmas is pagan. I want nothing to do with it. I love my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and His perfect written word. I want nothing to do with that garbage over there. A weight was lifted. They said that they, they were attacked by, it felt like they were being attacked by spirits. I hear brethren saying that, oh, I'm attacked by spirits. You're inviting them into your house. 
Stop inviting them into your house, and maybe you won't be attacked by spirits. Stop inviting them in. Right. Written for our learning. Remember we read that in Romans 14, 5. It says, written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The whole point of Jesus' birth is not for us to turn his birth into some kind of holiday or holy day. I had brethren say this, and you're 100% right, brother. It's to lead to the, the hope of salvation. His birth leads to the death, burial, and resurrection. Him dying for the world. He was born king of the Jews. He died savior of the world. He came for the Jewish people first. Salvation is of the Jews. He's calling Gentiles dogs. He had to give the Jews a chance first. He was born king of the Jews. Prophecy said that the savior of the world was going to be born. Yes, but he came for the Jews. That hope, what we learn from this, is that it leads to salvation. Okay. Lamentation 3.26 is a great example. You think, what? You're, like, what, you're going to the Old Testament? Bear with me. Lamentation 3.26. It is good that a man should, have, should both hope and quietly wait. What did we just read up there? That through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. That a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Jesus came. We have to wait till his death, burial, and resurrection. Now salvation has gone out into the world. What was written before time was written for our learning. We're not supposed to be elevating this and turning it into a holy day, uh, uh, a holiday, and start tur turning the baby in the manger into a false idol. Whether you're doing it intentionally, accidentally, or just going with the flow. You ever heard that saying, going with the flow? Culture, traditions of men. Okay. So we got that. But Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship. If you want to turn, turn to Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Once again, we compare the scriptures to tell us whether this is a good work or not. So we go to the scriptures. This isn't even in the scriptures. So that when you look up the history of all this, with all this actually law first mentioned, everything, it's false god worship created by the Catholicism, trying to do some of the Roman Empire's false gods that they tried to make it look Christian today. You know, like all the saints' names are actually false gods that they pray to. It's all false god worship. Have nothing to do with it. It's not a good work. We are created, unto, in, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Before ordained, things that are written before time are written for our learning, that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember, remember, that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, carnally minded and walking after the flesh, this is appealing, who are called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens, without Christ. Carly minded, walk after the flesh. This is, appeals to me. Without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's what this is over here. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off were made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. His, Jesus coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, we've talked about this. If he wasn't born in the likeness of sinful flesh, come and be born of a Virgin Mary in the likeness of sinful flesh, he couldn't die on the cross for us. He couldn't take on the sins of the world in his incorruptible body, hence the term incorruptible not capable of sin. He couldn't take the sins of the world on him. When you're lost, you love this stuff. This stuff is great. You get saved and now you're spiritually minded, walking after the flesh. You start noticing things aren't right with your life. Especially what we're talking about here. And you say, no, I'll stick to this. I'm just going to stick to the Word of God. I don't need that stuff. I don't even want that stuff anymore. That stuff is evil and wicked. I don't want it.
having no hope without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off from made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Right. First Thessalonians 5.8 we read. First Thessalonians 5.8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. We can read in this book and have a hope of salvation. Not just at the cross, Jesus' birth that leads to the cross, but we also have hope that someday we'll be redeemed from this wicked body of flesh that keeps tempting us to go to this junk over here, trying to make up excuses to go to this junk over here. It's not just with Christmas, it's with a lot of things in the world. But for this topic, we're talking about Christmas. We pray and we look for that hope. Lord, I'm so sick and tired of this flesh tempting me, tempting me, tempting me. And, and the thing is, is, it seems like I can go a long time without being tempted. And when I least expect it, that's when that flesh just tries to drive that knife right in. That temptation. Oh Lord, I'm looking forward to that blessed hope. I'm looking forward to someday that never having to deal with this junk over here ever again someday. Can I get an amen? How many of us have been talking to the Lord lately about the catching away? Especially with everything that's going on out there in the world today. The year is uh, 20... 21, December 2021, how bad it is out there, how wicked we're going to be seeing. We might be going through some hard times, brothers and sisters in Christ. How many of us are looking for that hope? Things that were written aforetime, not just having to do with the Old Testament, but this book was written, 2000, this book is 400 years old, the translation, but the words of God that are in it were written 2,000 years ago. So that we might have hope. That's why. Okay. Matthew twenty two twenty three. 23, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. Sadducees say there is no resurrection. They try to steal your hope. You have people coming along and messing up what the whole point of Jesus' birth is, trying to give hope. And they steal your hope and replace it with fleshly fun. It's all about the flesh. Fun, 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 fun. Now, brethren, what I have just told you, and I've shown you the scriptures, this is the story of Jesus Christ, the day of his birth. This is the day of his birth. And if I left something out, by all means, put it in the script, put it in the uh, uh, comment section. Right? This is the birth of Jesus Christ. I've shown you, and I've shown you this stuff, and I've shown you that since this isn't in the birth of Jesus Christ, you need to start asking yourself, where did this come from? I've got some studies on it. Some other brethren have some studies on it. You need to start researching what this is and realize it's not for a Christian, a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, and get it out of your life. Okay? Now, do you harden your heart with what I've just shown you? Are you going to harden your heart? You're going to let your... Pr There's some brethren have gotten really prideful. This message is for the body of Christ as a whole. Uh, the first time, I'll admit, the first time I did uh, t teachings on Christmas, it was I was trying to get the attention of a brother in Christ that was going the wrong direction. His pride has gotten so much that he won't listen anymore. I've put my hand out there, reached my hand out there to, to fellowship with him and say, hey, let's go through the scriptures like what I'm doing here, trying to show him the truth. With all these videos that I've done, there's brethren out there, that, brothers and sisters of Christ, they're going to keep saying we hate the birth of Jesus Christ. Even after this study, they're going to say, I hate the birth of Jesus Christ, but they love the birth of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they don't have a love of the truth. They don't have a love of the truth. Okay? There's people out there that are going to harden their hearts, but I'm trying to reach the ones whose heart hasn't been hardened by pride. Brothers and sisters of Christ, I'm trying to reach you that haven't really, well, I don't know. This is truth. This is lies. This is 100% pleasing to the Lord. That's 100% pleasing to the flesh and Satan. Which one are you going to choose? Do you get puffed up and prideful? Or do you humble yourself and acknowledge the truth? This thing's going around lately about we need to humble ourselves and brethren aren't, that are trying to tell us to humble ourselves aren't humbling themselves. We have brethren that are getting, they're just letting their pride run rampant. Are you going to humble yourself and acknowledge the truth that I have given you here today? And look into the traditions of men. Don't take my word for it. Look into it, brothers and sisters of Christ. And see how wicked it really is, the origins of all this. Law of first mention. 
If some of you are newly saved and you keep hearing me say the law of first mention, that's what we teach about the Bible. Most times the, a, a word that appears in the Bible, there's a law of first mention. It usually describes what that word means. And the next time it keeps using that word, you're supposed to automatically know what it means because the first time it mentioned it, it kind of described what it was. And we call it law of first mention. The law of first mention of Christmas is not the word of God. So you need to find out what this is, where it came from, who came up with it, the date, the tree, the Christmas lights, Christmas dinners, Christmas gifts, Christmas social gathering, Christmas carols, Christmas stockings, Santa, and on and on and on and on. You need to do the study for yourself, brother and sister Christ. Don't just take my word for it. This is important. It's about serving our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's about pleasing Him, not pleasing me. Pleasing Him. Mm -hmm. And when you do the study on this, and you see the truth like much of the most of us brothers and sisters in Christ have seen, the truth in all this, you need to get it out of your life. Don't just say, okay, I found the truth, and then reject the truth, so you can keep your pagan traditions. Culture. You need to get it out of your life. But brothers and sisters Christ, you're going to keep having people attack you and say, you don't love the birth of Jesus Christ if you attack Christmas. And there's nothing you can do for those people. If you've shown the truth like I've shown the truth, and they keep telling me that I'm a, I hate the birth of Jesus Christ, there's nothing you can do for them. They've gone the way of the world. It's between them and God at that point. It's between them and God. Luke 16, 13. They went the way of the world. It's between them and God. No servant can serve two masters. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. He will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And people say, well, that's just talking about money. No, instruction righteous, that talks about anything. If I have a job that needs to get done, you're not supposed to have two supervisors telling people how to do that job. One's going to say, do it this way. The other one's going to say, no, I want you doing it this way. And the person that they choose to listen to are the ones that they are holding up higher than the other. They love that one and hate the other. You can't have two masters. How does this apply to this more than anything? Let's keep reading. Okay. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also who were covetous, this over here, covetous, that's all this is, covetousness, and flesh, okay, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourself before men. How many times have I heard men justify themselves doing all this stuff, claiming they're doing it for the Lord, and they're justifying themselves before men, not before God, before men. But God knoweth your hearts. God looks at the heart, brothers and Christ. You can have people say, well, I do it for the birth of Jesus Christ. They're, God looks at the heart. This is why you really do it. Is this junk over here? God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Where is it at in Scripture? This is an abomination in the sight of God. It's highly esteemed among men. I saw a video... Uh, Jerusalem, huge towering Christmas tree with a five-pointed star on the top. They hate Jesus, but they love Christmas. And like I said, the lie out there that you'll hear from some people that they were lied to, and they're probably passing on that lie, so please be careful. I'm not calling you the liar. You're passing on a lie, so you're part of that lie. And that lie is, is that Christmas, this junk over here, was always Chris, Christian, and the world, the Catholic Church and the world, took it and perverted it. No, they didn't. Christmas was always perverted from day one. What got perverted was, is they're trying to take the birth of Jesus Christ and pervert it and turn, it into a, turn that baby Jesus into a false god. But Christmas itself was always perverted. The world as a whole, lost and saved, love Christmas. And that's how the Catholic Church designed Christmas. To be loved by all. What's the Jesuits' job again? To bring all authorities back under the authorities of Rome? Saved and lost? All these false religions and people with no religion? 
all back under the authority of Rome? Interesting, isn't it? If you love the birth of Jesus Christ, you will not mess with it. The world has messed with it. They've messed with the birth of Jesus Christ. They brought in Santa Claus, so now it doesn't even have to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. You see how that works, this is the way perversion works? But if you hate the birth of Jesus Christ as it is, you're going to add to it. Now, here's the thing, brothers and sisters, Christ, I know you're going to get upset. I don't hate the birth of Jesus Christ. Then let this be a man of God who loves his word and loves you, correcting you, saying this is wickedness and sin, get it out. If you truly love the word of God, get it out. Get it out. If you truly love the birth of Jesus Christ as it is, get rid of this junk over here. Well, I can't get rid of that junk. There's nothing wrong with me doing this. We have liberty. We Let every man be persuaded his own. Then you don't love the birth of Jesus Christ as it is. You can't get away from it. There's no getting away from it. Either you love the birth of Jesus Christ as it is, or you love the way of the world. You cannot serve two masters. And I've seen great men of God get messed up over here. Great men of God get messed up over there. John 8, chap, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Brothers and sisters of Christ, we're supposed to be a light unto the world. You're not supposed to be looking like the world. You're not supposed to be la acting like the world. You're supposed to be separate. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, should, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That's why this is so popular with the world. Most of the people that vehemently defend Christmas, and I don't want to let go of Christmas, and whether it's Santa Claus, whether it's supposed to, be told, supposed to be about this birth of Christ, a lot of them are not, not saved. A lot of them are not saved. You're saying this isn't, this isn't supposed to be a salvation issue. This isn't the salvation issue. What worries me, brothers and sisters in Christ, is the, their, your attitude towards the Word of God. Your attitude towards absolute truth. Your attitude to where God is the authority, and if God says it's wrong, do you get it out of your life? Or do you tell God, hey, take a hike, I'm going to keep this. And then you start looking in other areas of your life. You're saying the same thing in other areas of your life. Not just with Christmas. God, take a hike. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's not what a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman does. That's what a false convert does. But the point is, is this is blinding the minds of them that believe not. Someone once said that Christmas was the best time of the year to, to witness for Jesus Christ. No, Christmas is the best time of the year to create false converts. Because you're told all this has to do with Jesus Christ. And this is all godly and Christian. And you're creating a lot of false converts this way. It's the best time of the year to create false converts. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not this junk over here. James 4.4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, I say these things because this is what we do to show, hey, there's some false converts out there. But what's going on, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm calling you brothers and sisters in Christ, is you're forgetting your first love. You're starting to forget why Jesus died on the cross for you. You're starting to go back to the ways of the world. And you're getting enticed with good words and fair speeches. Don't do it. If you've given up Christmas, don't fall back into it. If you haven't given up Christmas and you've done the research, you need to give up Christmas. Period. If you haven't done the research, do the research. Like I said, don't take my word for it. Christmas was always perverted. Never Christian to begin with. Never. It's the way of the world. This is godly. 
going through the scriptures, thus saith the Lord, that's the world. You can't serve two masters. I did a study, I'll put the link to the study down below, called High Places or Church Buildings. And in there I talk about how um, the king of the 12 tribes, I, don't, I can't remember the name exactly, but you had Solomon, he got very wicked at the end of his life, uh, he got pulled away from God to worship false gods by his wives that were lost. They, it's not about, I understand that we use it a lot of times to say you need to marry within your kindred, but more importantly, he was marrying women from other cultures that brought in false gods. They were lost. They weren't Jewish. There's Gentiles that can become Jewish as far as the uh, get circumcised and obeying the laws of Moses, and they get brought in, okay? But these women were, were lost. They were worshiping false gods. But his son, after him, God broke the kingdom in half. Not half, but broke the kingdom into two pieces. You had um, Judah and, gosh, sometimes names just disappear, but I pray the Lord he'll give it to me. But the other 12, you had Judah and the tribe, Benjamin. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Benjamin and Judah. Okay, They stayed together where, and they, they still served uh, Solomon's son as king. But another king popped up that took the other 10 tribes that separated themselves and how did he keep them from going back and doing animal sacrifices? And I go through all the scriptures in this study. That's why I said I'm going to link the study below. But he went back. How to keep them from going. Because if they go back and start doing, obeying God's word, and they start doing animal sacrifices at Jerusalem and all the different gift offerings and whatnot at Jerusalem, it might reunite the kingdoms. But I want to be king. So what did he do? He gave them a false god. Christmas tree. He gave him an image that was the uh, calf, the golden calf. He gave him something to look at and go, ooh, ah, oh, that's so pretty, that's so amazing, that looks so great. There's your God. Then what did he do in that study? He, said, well, so he, he declared a festival, days of celebration where there's food, Drink, party, music, you know, dinner, gifts, lights, social gathering, party time, music. And it kept the Jewish people from going back. It kept them from obeying God's word. Can we learn from the Old Testament? Yes, you can learn from this and say, I'm not going to make that same mistake. I don't want anything to do with this. I worship and serve Jesus Christ, and Him only shall I serve. Him only. Brethren, I have nothing to gain. I have nothing to gain. I, I'm trying to please the Lord. People say, spiritually, I've got a lot to gain by doing this and staying here. I'm talking about doing this study, but staying over here. I've got a lot to gain spiritually. But physically? Brethren, I don't take donations. Why? Because God has provided food and clothing. I did it backwards. Clothing, and I point back in the kitchens on the other side of this wall, is the kitchen where the food is. He's provided me food and clothing. So I'm not doing this to draw disciples after me. You know, I want that donation. Got to get that donation. I don't take donations. I'm not gaining anything out of this physically. But here's the thing. I've actually lost things by standing for the Word of God. I'm going to do a study in the future about Paul, about the worst thing that you can lose for standing for the Word of God, and that's fellowship with the brother in Christ. When you make the stand like Paul did to Peter, he risked losing his fellowship, not salvation, but fellowship with Peter when he went and corrected Peter. When he corrected the first and second, uh, the Corinthians at Corinth, the church at Corinth, when he was correcting them on the sin and wickedness that they were doing, the sin and the wickedness that they were doing, he risked losing fellowship with brethren. When he got, when he got onto um, Barnabas and said, No, Ma, uh, John, whose surname is Mark, he keeps, he's, he's a traitor. He keeps betraying us. When it's time to go out there and witness for Jesus Christ and put your life on the line like you and I have, Barnabas, 
He betrays us and takes off. He won't do the work of the Lord, but he wants to re reap the benefits. The Lord says this is wrong, and I'm not going to put up with it. He's not going with us to confirm the churches. And Barnabas said, yes. Okay. John, you stay here. They, they, there's people, brethren, that, there's, that do teachings that make it out like they're both, it's just something they could agree to. No, Paul was in the right 100%. When you actually look at the study, and you look at the life that Paul and Barnabas had together, preaching the gospel, and how John, surnamed Mark, kept bailing on them. When it came time to, oh, you might give your life for Jesus Christ, you might get beaten for Jesus Christ, oh, I ain't doing that, I ain't preaching the gospel, I'm not preaching the gospel. I've come across Christians, this is a side I don't want to go too far off the side, but I've come across Christians that say, I'm not called to preach the gospel. They're cowards. Everybody, everybody is called into the ministry of reconciliation. You might not be called into a ministry where you're hardcore out there with signs, handing out gospel tracts, hardcore, and you know, yes. But you're still called to preach the gospel when the door opens. You're still called to do that. We are all called to do that. We're all ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And when you have someone that won't do it at all, I think false convert, and I think coward. All right? That's what's Mark, sir, John, surname Mark. All right? But Paul, he risked his fellowship with Barnabas to stand for the truth. Today would be the, word, the written word, but back then it was the spoken word. He risked and lost, and he lost fellowship with Barnabas. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I got nothing to gain okay, from telling you this physically. But what do I have to lose? I can lose fellowship with the brother in Christ. And I have by making this stand, saying this is truth, that's lies. I'm standing for the word of God. I'm standing for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's cost me. Brothers and sisters of Christ, it's going to cost you. I want to do a study on that and get more in depth on what was going on with P, uh, Paul and risking losing fellowship. It's going to cost you. But if, I've been taught, when I got first got saved, I got told that when you get saved and this becomes your foundation, all matters of faith and practice, you're going to lose lost family members don't want to be around you. You might lose your job. Uh, you'll lose your f lost friends and you know your health and your life. You might even lose your life for Jesus Christ. Okay, you get thrown in prison and hardly get to eat. Your health starts deteriorating. All for Jesus Christ. There's a lot of bad things that you'll lose because of this, standing for this. But the one thing that was never taught me was that one of the worst things you can lose for standing for this is fellowship with a brother in Christ. you still got to choose this, brother and sister in Christ. Stop being lukewarm. Stop being like, well, I, I, I believe it's wrong, but, but you know, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. And, you know, you can just do what you want to do. That's not love for a brother in Christ. And that's being lukewarm. We need to stand, stand, stand for absolute truth. I have nothing to gain from this, brother in Christ. In fact, I've lost a lot by standing for this book in my life. I'm here alone. My family doesn't hardly call anymore and talk to me anymore. My, I have no friends. I have acquaintances, but I have no lost world friends whatsoever. I have acquaintances. I have brethren that I get to talk to online from a distance because there's no I don't know of any brother Bible believing God fearing man or woman within a hundred miles of here, Perkins, Oregon. Okay, it's cost me a lot to stand for this book, and it's going to start costing us a lot in these coming days to stand for this book. Brothers, sisters, I'm not doing this to get a thrill. I'm not trying to start a debate. I'm not trying to sow division, okay? I'm trying to stand for truth. Truth divides. The Word of God is likened to a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways. It cuts me just as much as it's cutting you. I used to be into this stuff. I used to be a part of this junk. It cuts me as much as it cuts you. I'm telling you how wicked this is, and I think back of me enjoying this as a kid, that's not a fond memory. Why are you going back and trying to grab fond memories of this satanic junk over here? And trying to appeal to people's flesh. It cuts me. The Word of God cuts me just as much as it cuts you. I'm doing this because I love you, brothers and sisters of Christ. 
I see you heading for destruction. I see you straying from your first love, the Word of God. And I'm warning you. Are the physical cultures, well, another question to ask, okay. are the physical cultures, traditions of men, Tom, <laughs> traditions of men, more important than God? No, 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 they're not more important than God. Good. That's good. That's good. Are they more important than fellowship with the brethren? See, it got silent. It got quiet. What happened? Is it more important than God? Oh, no, 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 no. It's not more important. Than, is it more important than fellowship with the brethren? Cricket? 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 The whole saying when you hear crickets, it gets so quiet you can hear crickets. Is it more important? Is this junk over here more important than fellowship with the brethren? Some brethren have said yes. They've said yes, this is more important. And they've kicked brethren to the curb like they're nothing, so they can keep this. This is more important than fellowship with the brethren. Do not trade your birthright. Do not change your birthright. The true story of the birth of Jesus that leads to his death, burial, and resurrection, to getting saved and making this Bible, hiding it in your heart and making it your foundation, all matters of faith and practice. Don't trade your birthright for the mess of pottage like Esau did. Don't do it, brothers and sisters of Christ. Don't do it. Acts 20:29. 20, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, also, of your own selves shall men arise. These wolves come in and start sowing seeds of division with this junk over here, trying to destroy you as a Christian, and they start getting Christians who are truly saved to pass on and do the same thing. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Night and day with tears. I pray for the body of Christ, not just because of Christmas, but I see so many more brethren that just disappear. I see brethren that break fellowship with me that I just I still pray for them and I think about them and pray that they haven't gone the way of the world. But we're in the falling away. There's so many fakes and frauds out there and they're trying to infiltrate us and trying to act like one of us. To draw, to draw away disciples after them. This issue isn't a, am I of Philip or Brother Philip or am I of Brother Brian? It's not about to draw, drawing away disciples after them. It's about absolute truth. But some people get into where it's about drawing disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. He's warned us time and time again about false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, about not straying from the Word of God. Keep in memory what I have taught you. I'm the example. Where's Paul doing this garbage over here? He's not. Where's Peter doing this garbage over here? They're not. He's warning you through the Scriptures what you're to do and what you're not to do. False God worship. Verse 32, and now, brethren, I commend you to traditions of men. I keep doing that because, no, that's what people are acting like, that I commend you to this. This is their God. Culture is their God. Traditions of men is their God. No, it says here, I give, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. That's all I'm doing, brothers and sisters in Christ. That's all I'm doing. Don't forget your first love. The Word of God. Don't give, a, don't sell your birthright for a mess of pottage. And it's not just with Christmas, it has to do with the world. Now you can't lose your salvation. No, I'm not saying that. But you can get really messed up as a Christian. The lost world is doing this. And then you start acting like the lost world, you start looking like the lost world. Brothers and sisters of Christ, you're turning your backs on the Word of God. We just read there. 
I commend you to God and the word of his grace, not culture, not traditions of men. His grace, his word, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Think about that real quick. It's the body of Christ. If standing by his word is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among the body of Christ, what does straying from the word of God do? It tears you down. You start losing inheritances in the body of Christ among the saints at the judgment seat of Christ. You start losing this. I mean, not this. You start losing inheritance when you start getting into this junk over here. When you start straying from the Word of God, it's, you start to be torn down by the world. You start losing inheritance. You start become less and less useful to the Lord to the point where you can become a worthless Christian. Notice I said, Christian, you're saved, but you're worthless. God can only use you as a bad example. That's it. So brothers and sisters in Christ, when someone comes along and says, hey, you must not love Jesus' birth because you're against all this junk over here. You must be really against Jesus' birth. Really? This is Jesus, what happened on the day of Jesus' birth. Let's go through it one last time. A star appeared to the wise men. Off in the distance, the star appeared and started guiding him here. Not over the manger. He was born in Bethlehem. Our Savior was born in Bethlehem, the city of David. It was preordained that he'd be uh, in the city of David. He was born in a manger in a stable with just his mom and dad there, or his mom and stepfather. Joseph's not his father. Mary's his mother. Okay, With Joseph and Mary there, angels appeared in the field and they said the things that they said. They didn't sing. There wasn't a carol. Okay? They said it. But the angels appeared to the shepherds. The shepherds went. And they only found Joseph, Mary, and Jesus in the manger. There was no animals in there. This is truth. And you tell them this. Okay, let's go to the scriptures then. Let's do the story of Jesus Christ, the day of his birth. This is the day of his birth. Now tell me, where's all this junk over here at? And now tell me again that I'm the one that, that hates the birth of Jesus Christ, this, and you love the birth of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters Christ, stand firm for the word of God. We're not the ones that hate the birth of Jesus Christ. We're not the ones that have a problem. You might not hate it, but we're, not the, we're the ones that, not, that don't have a problem with the birth of Jesus Christ, as it is in Scripture. These people do. They have a problem with it. So I pray, 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 brother, sister Christ, that this has convicted you and this gets you back on the right path of putting God's word first. That this gets you to go to the brethren. <laughs> Dropped another thing. This gets you to go to the brethren. Okay? That you have wronged over this and that you apologize. That you be humble. That you drop the pride. Truly, truly, present tense, Drop the pride. Not talking about pride that you dropped in the past. Present tense, drop the pride and go back and apologize to the brethren and get your fellowship back with the brethren. And it might not just be with Christmas, it would be with a lot of things that people use the stupidest excuses, holding on to the world, holding on to anger, holding on to bitterness, and they won't forgive their brother in Christ or they need to get forgiveness from their brother in Christ, brother or sister in Christ. That's the whole goal of this, brothers and Christ. This is to bring us back into unity. This is all about division. I'm sorry, I'm doing it wrong. This is all about division. When you've got this next to this, that's division. You get rid of this junk over here, we have unity. We're of one mind, one body. There's no division when this is the final authority. There's no division when God is the final authority. Division, every time I've seen division in my life as a Christian, it's always because someone strayed from the Word of God and started holding culture, traditions of men, rudiments of the world. Remember what the Bible says about that? 
not after Christ. When you start going off the traditions of men, the rudiments of the world, and you start getting spoiled by the philosophy, the philosophy that goes along with all of this, you realize that it's pulled you away from the Lord of the Lord, and you're not going after Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please, 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 get back to your first love. Please, 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 let's get back to being one mind. Let's get back to striving together for the Word of God, for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and His perfect written Word. That's my plea to you, brothers and sisters of Christ. This isn't me trying to cause division. This is me trying to unite us again with the Word of God. So grace and peace, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you in these last days, my love for you. We desperately need fellowship. We desperately need to be coming together. My love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm praying for you. Pray for me, brothers of Christ. I'm praying for you. But this is it. And thank you, thank you for watching and being patient and making it through this video.